I'm going to cover bipolar disorder, but a lot of this is actually applicable for, dis for depression and for schizophrenia as well. But the reason why we chose bipolar disorder is because when we looked at the rheumatological um, diagnosis, we see mood disorder mainly mentioned. We looked at case reports, several case reports of bipolar type presentations rather than just schizophrenia. So there was a lot of affective psychosis and we thought we'd get more information there, which is uh, the main reason why we looked at bipolar disorder. And, and interestingly, in 2012, Le Boyer published a paper uh, talking about bipolar disorder as a multi-system inflammatory disorder. Um, and evidence actually suggests that there is a lot of inflammation in bipolar disorder. So these are some snippets which, I've, which are there in your slides as well. But the main ones I'd like to point out are we know that interferon alpha, for example, can trigger off manic episodes. Um, so mania and hypomania have been described. And there are clear abnormalities and imbalance between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And what we find here is white matter hyperintensities. These have been hypothesized to result from inflammatory causes. But as I mentioned, um, more recently, parallels have been shown between bipolar disorder and multiple sclerosis. So there's something to look out for. Interestingly, two interesting things are the role of leptin and insulin growth factor which comes under the metabolic syndrome. We know that bipolar affective disorder, affective psychosis have very high rates of metabolic syndrome. And there may be elements such as leptin and IGF, which can trigger off deficiencies of which can trigger off um, a, a prolonged inflammatory state. Metabolic syndrome is an inflammatory state in, in many ways. Um, What's the data about autoimmunity? So we looked at the inflammation. We know there's immune dysregulation, but is there actual data for autoimmunity? One interesting thing is our association with lithium and thyroid dysfunction. You, in clinical practice, we, we may usually carry out a thyroid test, but we don't tend to do thyroid antibodies. But what we do know is that thyroid autoimmunity is an independent risk factor for bipolar disorder with no association with lithium exposure. I see this in clinical practice, especially since I've understood this or, you know, this has come to the fore. A large proportion of patients have thyroid autoimmunity and not on lithium. Extremely high levels of thyroid antibodies and with their TSH, T3, T4 normal. And I'll come to another disorder um, later on, Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So the question is, what is going on here? We know that lithium can induce autoimmune thyroiditis and one of the mechanisms might be through the um, acceleration of the NFKB, uh, the inflammatory state. On the other hand, increased autoantibody production, increased ANA and autoimmune processes precede the onset of bipolar disorder. And this is from a large study. This was in Algeria, but there are other, Eaton published in 2010 in the British Journal of Psychiatry as well. So there is evidence of autoimmunity going on. But when we look at neuropsychiatric data, there's very little studies, very few studies that have been done that have looked at autoimmunity as such. So the real question is, we know that cytokines are disturbed, but cytokines come from T and B cells. So what's happening there? And I think there's more to look into from that aspect. There are three main disorders that we looked at when we looked at the data in neurology, immunology, rheumatology, and endocrinology. The first disorder was neuropsychiatric SLE. Some of this was covered earlier. The commonest symptoms in neuropsychiatric SLE are cognitive dysfunction, mood disorders, headache, seizures, and psychosis. So this is from Popescu and Cow, 2011. So cognitive dysfunction features very, very commonly. Neither a normal ESR nor negative serology excludes CNS lupus. In fact, Joseph, the article that he published actually showed that there is Serology does not have any correlation with CNS lupus, but there was another article that showed that there is there's a possibly a negative association with systemic features um, in, in CNS lupus. Interestingly, a subset of the anti-DNA antibody is known to cross-react with the NR2 glutamate receptor. So this is from DiGiorgio. And elevated antibodies to the NR2 subunit of the glutamate receptor in the acute phase of mania has been shown but not at follow-up. 
So there have been antibodies to the glutamate receptor again. So glutamate is playing an important role here. And what they, in contrast to the anti and MD encephalitis, what they found was the antineural antibodies in neuropsychiatric lupus recognized the NR2A and NR2B subunits whilst in anti-NMDA encephalitis, it's the NR1. And that may explain the difference in the uh, presentations because the NR2 and NR2B are actually highly concentrated in the hippocampus, which explains why cognitive dysfunction might be a very prominent clinical feature. And uh, it's the multi-histocompatibility complex region of chromosome 6 that has been implicated. Um, Moving on further, um, what's found in the actual uh, imaging? So we do know that PET abnormality, spec perfusion defects have been found. And as I mentioned, there's no clinical correlation with intravascular processes or classic signs or, or lab signs of SLE. And MRI often yields discrete white matter lesions. So I'll, I'll give you a, an example of a case. So this was a, a lady, 39-year-old female that I'd seen in clinical practice, was presenting to the emergency department with aggressive outbursts. And when I saw her, she said, I'm not an aggressive person. I don't quite know what's happening. She was labeled with, as you would expect, personality disorder and uh, possible bipolar. She'd, on history taking, there seemed to be an element of bipolarity, but the question was, is there an organic component uh, underlying? On history taking, she had migraines, headaches for many, many years, and on physical examination had extreme sort of purplish tips of her fingers. Um, on neurological examination, cogwheel rigidity, she wasn't on antipsychotic um, me medication, she had tremors. So a very neurological picture carried out um, serological testing, which showed an ANA of one, one is to 1,320. And uh, this sort of came down later to one is to 640. Uh, but the DSDNA wasn't elevated. She had a TSH of less than 0 0.01 with, T with T3, T4 normal. I referred her to a rheumatologist. Uh, she, she actually had erythrocytes in her um, urine as well and an elevated creatine. I referred her to the rheumatologist, and the rheumatologist uh, diagnosed her with probable lupus. Um, the MRI showed white matter lesions here. She actually had no episodes for the last probably eight to nine months now. Um, no presentations to the ED. She's on olanzapine, five milligrams. She's on valproate and hydroxychloroquine, uh, 100 milligrams. She is still complaining, however, of headaches. Anticardiolipin antibodies and antiphospholipid have been negative. But headaches are a very prominent feature still. She still has some memory dysfunction, but her mood symptoms have resolved. So she's, these are the white matter hyperintensities, and this is her spect. So there was hyperperfusion areas here, which was reported by the radiologist, and similar hyperperfusion areas here. The pathogenesis um, when we looked at NPSLE is multifactorial. There are several antibodies uh, that have been mentioned, some stronger than the others, but there's other things such as vasculopathy, cytokine-mediated damage of parenchyma, direct damage, as I've shown earlier, premature atherosclerosis. But uh, what these antibodies might seem to do is to activate interferon through the pr production of immune complexes. Moving on, um, the other autoimmune disease that we looked at was synaptic antibodies. And what was striking here was the anti nmd encephalitis. And Dalma writes that 75% of presentations of anti nmd encephalitis uh, present to psychiatrists first. So it's, it's a very prominent sort of disorder that's something that we should be highly vigilant for. Over 50% of cases are not associated with the neoplasm, but it's, we know that there is a strong association with ovarian teratoma. So it's always helpful in a young female to consider um, uh, an ultrasound. And diverse psychiatric symptoms, um, the positive aspect is that 75 to 80% make a full or substantial recovery when the cause is found and treated. Several um, antibodies have been mentioned as well. So this is there, I won't go through this, but this is there in, in your uh, slides as well, just as a, as a clear guideline as to what can be done if um, someone does come across this. The next one, I think a real conundrum, is the autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, there have been several names given, Hashimoto's encephalopathy, uh, steroid responsive encephalopathy associated with autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, and 
the, the difficulty here is that what we do know is it's brilliant, it has a brilliant response to steroids. And in some cases where steroids have been required for only a month um, with complete remission, several cases. A recent review has also been published, um, and I've given you the references in, at, the, at the end as well. So Castillo de Holanda in two, 2011. And what we find here again is the slow waves. Cognitive dysfunction, behavioral changes, fluctuating symptoms, and the key uh, antibody is the anti-TPOAB antibody, um, which is usually elevated in the thousands. But clinical practice often reveals um, elevated thyroid antibodies in 500s or 200s or 300s, with, especially in bipolar. And the question is, what, what is going on there? Is it simply autoimmune thyroiditis that doesn't require treatment, or is it something more? But what is particularly interesting is that the antithyroid antibodies actually cross-react with the glutamate um, receptor as well. So there is a cross-reaction that's present and therefore a biological plausibility there as well. Vasculitis is the other mechanism. So the take-home message for Sriat, uh, as mentioned by, in Castillo's article, is that the presence of thyroid antibodies in serum, not the level, was the clinical rel clinically relevant issue indicating that SRIAT should be considered in patients with encephalopathy, even if thyroid antibody levels are only mildly elevated. The other um, take home message is SRIAT should be considered in patients with encephalopathy, regardless of whether they're euthyroid or mildly hypothyroid, because this is something in clinical practice that we often come across. The TSH is normal. Um, there's nothing to worry about. So coming back to our case that we, of the young girl initially, the question is, is this neuropsychiatric lupus According to the rheumatologists, no. Um, antineural antibodies, we know it's antineural, but not anti-NMDA. What we do know is the glandular fever, and that was a clinical criteria for lupus, the alternative criteria. Um, but the diagnostic and therapeutic challenge was really important. So I think there are several other cases like this, and collaboration is, is I think, going to be extremely important, because once, I think, this case was identified, the service, there were several others. Um, that we were able to identify which the neuroimmunologists took on board. So I think it can generate quite a lot of interest um, amongst trainees and everyone else. Um, what we did in the article was look at the literature. This has not been validated in any way because there hasn't been really studies looking at diagnostic testing, but we came up with a list of criteria, uh, which is there in your um, handouts as well, where uh, if there are a number of these symptoms, it should raise suspicion of autoimmunity. And you may find that there are several commonalities with what Professor Hughes sort of talked in this earlier talk. And one, one thing that stands out is catatonia. Catatonia is such a, uh, a strong, has a strong association with um, autoimmunity, particularly lupus, and I'll come to a case later on. So movement disorders, because the other thing I notice is Lishman very clearly mentions that never reflexly assume that movement disorders are a consequence of the antipsychotics, because what might be happening is that it's, it's purely exacerbating an underlying organic issue. Um, and I find that a useful clinical um, a clue. And seizures, of course, acute behavioral personality change, abnormal EEG. So I hope this is helpful um, and you know, hopefully may become a basis for, for history taking. I find this extremely useful personally. So family history of autoimmunity is the other very strong associator.